Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you today. I'm Pastor Aaron Taylor. Welcome to worship at Alma Church of God. A special welcome to those of you who are watching us online today. We're so glad that you are here with us uh, as well. Um, well, today we are here to worship the Lord together. And, you know, as you come into this space today or as you join us online, I don't know how you're doing today or what might be on your mind or what's going on in your heart today. I just want to remind you that the Lord is with us, and he invites us to come just as we are. And I'm praying that today you encounter Jesus and that you feel his joy and his hope at work in your life. Church family, uh, you, uh, you probably know that Pastor Ben normally does the welcome in our service, and I want to ask you to be praying for him and for his family. Uh, he is on the road today on his way to Indiana. His grandma passed away, and they have visitation later today, and he's officiating that service tomorrow. So pray for Pastor Ben and his family uh, in the midst of these days. Well, hey, we want to connect with you today. So for those of you here in the sanctuary, you'll find a connect card in the seat racks. Uh, if you would complete that and let us know how we can pray for you this week. If it's your first time here, uh, be sure to complete that connect card. We'd love to follow up with you. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And you can do that online as well. You'll find a link there in the stream, almacog.org slash connect card, uh, where you can fill that out online. Well, many of you this morning were here uh, a little bit early today. Sunday school is back and coffee is back. Woo! Yeah, it was a good way to start the day. I see there's more energy in the room because you've had caffeine. This is good. This is good. Uh, so uh, if you didn't have a chance to jump in this morning, come join us next week. We have Sunday school for all ages and coffee fellowship uh, is back as well. Well, today we're starting a new series called Encounter Joy, a seven-week experiment to spark joy all around us, and I can hardly wait. Friends, will you stand with me? Speaking of joy, let's lift our voices today and praise the Lord. It is a good day to praise Him. Thank you. 
Oh, gracious God, we bow our hearts before you. You are the almighty God. God, we rest in your presence today. We rest in your provision and in your care. God, we know that, that you are not distracted or turned away. God, we thank you for the way that you are aware and engaged, for the way that you are pursuing us with your extravagant love. God, the truth is we are in awe of you today. And God, I pray for each one of us today. Lord, you know us through and through. and You know the things that are on our hearts this day. So God, we pause in your presence and we say that we trust you with the things that matter so deeply to us, with the people that, that we're lifting to your throne right now. God, hear our prayers. And God, together as a people, we come before you and we humbly ask to move and work through us as a body of Christ. God, that you would continue to use us for your mission in the world. God, that you would help us to be people who are humble before you. God, that you would do your healing work in our midst so that we can be people who help share that good news with others. God, I pray for each of us in our places of influence, that you would help us, God, uh, to love others generously, that they might experience you. God, we pause and pray today for Pastor Ben and for his family in this time of grief. Lord, we pray that uh, at his grandma's funeral tomorrow at the visitation tonight, that they would experience your presence. And God, we know there are many in our midst who are grieving. Uh, and so, God, we pray for your comfort and for your strength. And we thank you that you are the God of hope. You are the God who brings life, even in the most difficult moments. God, we praise you today. We thank you for the joy of who you are. And I pray that we would continue to encounter you this day. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. As we continue this morning, I want you to stand with us as we lift our praises this morning. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise.
Well, are you feeling grateful for spring these days? Oh, doesn't it just feel good for our souls? Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've especially enjoyed lately just seeing uh, life in our community, seeing people out walking and uh, enjoying the weather. And, and, and as I see people walking downtown and uh, in different places, you know, I, I, I just find myself filled with gratitude again when I think about where our church is located in our community. What a great gift we have uh, to be right here in the heart of our downtown. Are you grateful for our church? <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. There is so much to be grateful for. There are so many stories that we can tell of God's faithfulness to us. And, and my friends, I want to remind you that that's an important thing for us these days. Because the, the truth is, I think this is a disorienting time, isn't it? Wow. We've just been through something as a church family that we've never done before, going through a pandemic, and, and we're still trying to find our way through that and still trying to navigate how we make decisions out of this. And I know that this is a time where, where uh, things are disorienting. So much of how we do things together has been disrupted. And I know that we have questions together about what, what's the long-term impact going to be. And I know that, that that can spark feelings of worry and anxiety as we try and process what does it mean about who we are and how we move forward together. And so I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, but also at a moment like this, this is the perfect time for us to go back to the basics and ask the question, who are we, why are we here, and what is our mission? And so that's where I want us to dive in today. Today, we are in, uh, beginning our journey, a seven-week experiment to spark joy all around us. It's called Encounter Joy. And, and I'm hoping and praying that, that this series uh, will be a time that reminds us who we are and the mission that God has for us. And I think this is going to be a lot of fun together. You know, here's the good news as we think about what we're walking through. This is not the first time for followers of Jesus to walk through disruptive times. <laughs> this is not the first time. And we have a God who specializes in taking things that are messy and broken and working for good and doing something beautiful. And I know and believe that he is doing that in our Midst. So today, uh, we're going to spend some time and talk about our identity and our mission together. Now, you, re you may remember all the way back in the fall of 2019, that feels like forever ago. It was not forever ago, but it feels like a long time ago. Uh, we shared a, a new logo that we had, and we began using this language, encountering Jesus together. And all of this was, was crafted uh, after a journey that we went on uh, to, to really discover who we are as a church, um, to, to think about the roots that we have and what God has been doing here for over a century, and to challenge us to continue uh, to walk out that mission together. So let's remind ourselves uh, who we are and how it all began for us. It was the late 1800s, early 1900s, when something was happening here in central Michigan. The Church of God movement was growing, and there was a group of Jesus followers with a passion, who, a passion to help others encounter this Jesus and to come together in unity. Now, much of what was happening uh, was stirring just down the road from here in St. Louis, uh, where there was a growing congregation and there was a camp meeting. Many of you know well the St. Louis camp meeting. And this early group of Church of God believers, uh, they were not out to build a kingdom for themselves, but they rather uh, were eager to come alongside others and to help this movement expand all in the name of Jesus. And in 1914, a small group of these Church of God folks uh, began gathering right here in Alma at the home of Edward and Melva Andrews on Moyer Street. And these gatherings were called cottage prayer meetings. It was a time of prayer and a time of worship together. 
The truth is, kind of those first meetings together, there was a little bit of struggle trying to get things going until there was a turning point. Melva Andrews, who was the hostess of these meetings, became seriously ill. And so what these believers did is they they did what countless Jesus followers have done for thousands of years. They came together to pray. And other leaders came, some leaders from the uh, St. Louis Church of God came together. And and we can imagine how it happened. There in Melva's home on Moyer Street, they gathered around her, perhaps around her bedside. There they stood in the face of a situation that, that seemed hopeless, and they chose to refocus their hearts, choosing to to look to the creator, the healer, the restorer, asking for hope and for healing and for help. After all, Jesus invites us to do that very thing. And so these believers gathered around Melva, Andrews, and they earnestly prayed. And what happened next changed everything. Melva was miraculously healed. (laughs) It was a miracle of healing. And and I don't know what the details of her story were. I would love to know a little bit more about what the situation was and, and how that miracle occurred and how God answered that prayer. But we do know, even though we don't know the details, that it was a miracle of God. And that's the important part. What we do know is that it was an encounter with Jesus. Because really, the story isn't about Melva. The story is about Jesus. <laughs> and that's the beginning of our church. This miracle of healing was the catalytic moment that birthed our church. And it was this encounter with Jesus that drew much attention. And more and more people became, uh, be, uh, began coming to this cottage prayer meeting. And more and more people began to encounter Jesus. And our young church grew and grew. And people were choosing to follow Jesus. And they were baptized in the Pine River. Let's not do that part again. All right? Just, just saying. I love the story of our church, and I love that it all began with an encounter with Jesus, with a miracle on Moyer Street. (laughs) And our church grew and grew, and in those first few decades, our church was steadily outgrowing uh, new space after new space as we sought to find a place to worship, and we needed more space. And it just so happened in 1957 that the Alma Presbyterian congregation was vacating their building and building a new facility on the west side of town to accommodate their growth. And that meant that this building, which was built in 1899, was for sale. And so in October of 1957, our congregation took a joyful walk to enter this new home. Now, there's a few of you who were here. Can I put you on the spot? Will you raise your hand if you are part of? All right. Awesome. Awesome. And here we are, 64 years later, in this beautiful, sacred space where people have been encountering Jesus Some Presbyterians before us with the Church of God, people have been encountering Jesus in this space for 122 years. Isn't that incredible? When we think about the story of our church, we know it didn't stop with just this building, but the vision uh, of our church was to serve our community, and, and, and that vision kept growing. And it was the early 1980s when the business adjacent to our property, the Burlingame Body Shop, was selling their property. Would we be interested in purchasing it? And a congregational meeting was held to discuss this. And and the turning point was when Agatha Beard, an elderly woman of faith, stood up and she said, the thing that will help this church to walk by faith and reach out to meet needs of the community. That's what our church needs to do, to reach out and meet the needs of the community. And so our congregation purchased that building and turned it into his place, Family Enrichment Center. And since it opened in 1983, we've been connecting with 
thousands of people, thousands of families in our community through basketball leagues and exercise classes and parenting and family events and after school programs and block parties and so, so, so much more. Decades of fostering encounters with Jesus. And it didn't stop there. In 2001, our youth moved into the newly renovated filling station. And that building was purchased in 1999 as our growing youth group needed more space because our church family has a history that that we love investing in the next generation. And so that became part of our story. What was once an auto garage was now a place, is now a place for youth to encounter Jesus. We think about the story of these three buildings that are a part of our campus. And I think about the way that God has so generously provided to us. And friends, I think it is no accident that we are here. I think it's no accident that we are right here at 200 West Superior Street. And we are uniquely positioned in our city. Uniquely positioned to help foster encounters with Jesus in our community. And as we consider the mission that God has for us right here in the heart of Alma, uh, I want to remind us that we have four core statements about God and the mission that he's inviting us to join. And I want to remind us about that. The first one is this. God works in the world through Jesus because he loves the world. See, this love mission of God came to fruition through Jesus Christ. It was early in the ministry of Jesus when he himself described his mission. And he picked up the scroll using the words of the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, this right here, this passage of Scripture, this is the mission of Jesus. To take brokenness and to set things right. To bring healing and restoration and freedom. To proclaim that there is good news. God is near and he wants freedom for you. This is the mission of God that continues today. Now, as we look at this, now let's look at how this continues to move through the New Testament. This is the mission of Jesus. And then Jesus commissions his followers. Friends, that's us. We too are Jesus followers. Jesus commissions his followers to participate in this very mission. In John 20, 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. See, that means you, my friend, have been commissioned by Jesus to continue this very mission. Whoa, that's amazing. Jesus is inviting us to be a part of this mission. In fact, uh, in Scripture, we're actually called the body of Christ. We think about when Jesus was here on earth in bodily form. Now we, as the church, we are called the body of Christ. We get to live out this mission. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you a part of it. That means that, that, that for us here, that, that we as Alma Church of God, we are the embodiment of the mission of Jesus. That Jesus was sent with a mission, now sends us to continue this mission as his body on earth. So that means that we get to own this mission of Jesus. And I want to invite you to do that. Will you say this aloud with me? There we go. We are the body of Christ. The spirit of the Lord is on us because he has anointed us to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent us to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's 
favor. Isn't that amazing? This is our mission. And you know, the truth is, it is not about us. <laughs> and it is not about us trying to build our own kingdom. No, there is one Savior. And we're invited to join him in what he is doing all around us. He wants to work through us. Second statement, encounters with Jesus bring about transformation and healing. Jesus is a healer. And when we encounter him, it changes us. We are transformed when we encounter Jesus. And I just want to remind us of that good news right now. Because I know these are challenging days that we are living through. We're living through a, a moment in history where so many things have been turned upside down, where layers have been peeled back, things have been revealed and uncovered. There's a lot of mess in our world these days. And it requires some humility from us to face reality. But I remind you that what is revealed can be healed. And so even though there's a lot of mess these days, what is revealed can be healed. <laughs> this is the good work of our God. Friends, Jesus is in the business of bringing life right in the spaces that we thought were death. <laughs> right through the pile of ashes, our God brings life. And I don't know what hard things you might be walking through in your life these days. But I just want to remind you today that the power of Jesus is real. And he's working. And he wants freedom and healing for you. Do you know him? Perhaps today is the day for the first time to trust him as your healer, as your savior. Or maybe today for in a renewed way to remember who he is and to give your life and your heart to him. See, Jesus longs to show up in your life and to be gracious to you. Encounters with Jesus bring about transformation and healing. Third statement, all of life is packed with potential to encounter Jesus. This is a powerful concept for us because if we live believing that this is true, then we get to walk around with a sense of expectancy. You know, in the opening chapter of John's gospel, he introduces us to Jesus. Jesus, who is the second person of the Trinity, and he gives us the big picture view. And he says it this way, John 1.14 in the message. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> See, this is the good news of the gospel. It's the good news for our community right here. Jesus is on the scene, and he has come with a mission. He is present and working all around us. And we can encounter Jesus in all kinds of spaces in our daily lives. That means there's, there's no division of space, that, that these are the sacred spaces and these are the secular spaces, and I can only expect to encounter God when I go to a sacred space. No, no, no. Jesus has moved into the neighborhood. That means all of life is packed with potential to encounter Jesus. He is present and at work all around us. In fact, we might be surprised to realize that the places where we are most likely to encounter Jesus are places that are anything but religious. Because if we study his life and his ministry, that's where he loves to hang out. Because he came to set the broken and the battered free. So so that's where he shows up. <laughs> so I wonder what would happen if we lived as if it was true that all of life is packed with potential to encounter Jesus. I wonder, I wonder what kind of expectancy would we have as we move around our daily lives realizing that, that every place we go, that in every person that we talk to, there's an opportunity to encounter Jesus. Jesus, friends, let's keep our eyes wide open and notice what God is doing. Fourth, our church is uniquely positioned to foster encounters with Jesus. 
we know that we are uniquely positioned in our city, that we've got great visibility, we've got great influence. But as we, as we say this, that our church is uniquely positioned in our city, let's think about what we mean by the word church. When Jesus said, as it's recorded in the New, in the New Testament, I will build my church, he wasn't talking about a building. Ecclesia, church, as, as Jesus talked about in the New Testament, was not a building. Ecclesia is a gathering or an assembly of people, people who are called for a specific purpose. The church is not a building. The church is a people. We are the church. In any space we inhabit, we are are the church. Now, here's, here's why this matters. Because if the church is a building, then it looks like this for us to be perfectly positioned in our city. That's a great position in our city to be. But if we as a people are the church, it looks like this. <laughs> now, that's something to be excited about, isn't it? This is where the church is in our city and off the map and far beyond just this small area. This is incredible. This sparks such joy for me. I hope it does for you. When I think about uh, the influence that's represented in our church family, it's absolutely incredible. I wonder, my friend, <laughs> where would you place those pins on the map? When you think about uh, the places in your daily life and the people that you interact with, have you ever thought about the fact that God has perfectly positioned you for the mission that God has for you? God has perfectly positioned you for the mission that God has for you. So here's what God asks of us. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 from the message Here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. You are perfectly positioned to spark joy. You can take your everyday, ordinary life and spark joy. And that, my friends, is our mission for these next seven weeks, to share some joy with our community. After all, we have the best good news ever. So we ought to be people who have some joy. And when we spark joy, that can happen in the most ordinary and simple kinds of everyday moments. And when we spark joy, we do that not just with the surface happiness or, or simply kindness, but we do so because joy is rooted in us, in a deeper reality, in the love of God. And that is the source of our joy, that we are extravagantly loved by God. That fills us with joy. And then as we see others knowing that they too are loved by God. Friends, I think that our world needs some joy these days. There's a lot of things uh, spreading around our world today, a lot of discouragement, rage, anxiety, you, you name it. So let's be people that spread some joy. And I wonder, what might happen in our community if we were intentional to spark joy in our places of influence. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about that in the weeks to come. We're going to dive into joy. We're going to study that in Scripture together. And as we get started today, I want to ask you to ponder two things. The first thing is, is, is this. What sparks joy in your life? What sparks joy in your life? You might think about uh, the last time that, that someone reached out to you in an intentional way and it just encouraged you so much or or you might think about, you know, that really good piece of chocolate that you had that sparked some joy. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but I want you to think, what sparks joy in your life? Don't take that too seriously. Let's have fun with this, okay? What sparks joy in your life? I want you to think about that this week. And then second, 
where has God uniquely positioned you to spark joy? I want you to pay attention to the relationships in your life and the places of influence that you have and begin thinking about where God has uniquely positioned you to spark joy. And let's see what God might want to do in these coming weeks. And let's ask God to give us some big ideas, some really big ideas, so that we can spark joy in the name of Jesus and help people encounter him. Now, in the coming weeks, I'm going to ask everyone to identify a specific joy experiment, okay? A joy experiment in your life, a specific way that you are perfectly positioned to spark joy. And I think this is going to be so much fun. I can't wait to see what God has in store. Friends, will you stand and pray with me? Our gracious God, as we bow our hearts before you today, as we stand in this place, God, we do so with humble hearts. And we thank you, God, for the journey of this church family. We thank you, God, for ways that you are at work, for ways that you are the healer, for the ways that you are the redeemer and the restorer, for the way that we as broken and imperfect people can look to you and encounter you. And God, we pray today for the future of our church family. And we pray today, God, that your good work would continue. We pray today, God, that you would help us to be humble and to listen well and have the courage to obey what you ask of us. And God, I pray uh, for my friends today, those here in the room and those watching online. God, I pray that the joy of your salvation would be real in each of our hearts today. God, you know the places where we are discouraged and we need some hope. And God, I pray that by the power of your spirit, that we might know your joy today. And God, I pray that today and in the days to come, you would help us to be people who spark joy all around us because of who you are. God, we love you, and we thank you for the way that you invite us to be a part of your mission. It's in the strong name of Jesus that we pray, and together we say, amen. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one and we can see that God you're moving a mighty river through the nations and young and old will turn to Jesus fling wide your heavenly gates prepare the way of the Jubilee is coming when young and old return to 
that you are here today. I'm so glad that we are part of this church family together. Uh, And I want to encourage you in the coming days, uh, be thinking about ways that you can spark joy all around you and start thinking, start asking God about a joy experiment that he might have for you. Uh, We're going to talk more about that in the weeks to come, but I'm praying that God places some big things on our hearts. In fact, uh, as part of that, we actually have a joy experiment fund that we can help fuel some of these joy experiments in our community. I think this is going to be great. And friends, uh, that leads me to say, I'm so grateful for the generous giving of our church. Your faithful and generous giving helps fuel ways that we can help others encounter Jesus. I want to remind you that those giving boxes are at the door if you're here in person. You can give online anytime. That's what my husband and I do. Give online at almacog.org slash give. There's also a text number where you can text a gift if you'd like. Thanks for helping to fuel the mission faithfully and generously. I'm so glad we get to do that together. It's fun to be generous, and I'm excited about some new ways for us to do that this spring. Friends, I love you. I'm praying for you this week, and now let's close our service and read aloud together our final word. This we call to mind, and therefore we have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen.